Well, I want to get into your background and all that stuff and talk about how you ended up on YouTube and give people an idea of who you are. But yeah, um, let's start with something spicy, a hot topic that a lot of people have asked me about. And I always kind of defer and say, you know, I'm not really qualified to answer this question, but you are, which is the topic of venue merch splits. Uh, these bands, like, I don't, I don't, I mean, everyone's complained about it, but I guess most recently, probably architects saying, mm -hmm. you know, why are venues taking 30% of our merch sales or whatever it is? Can you explain that to everybody and give them idea of like, why is that a thing? And why don't artists collectively just say, no, we're not doing this anymore. So it's, it's wild that this is coming up so much now, because this is like, this isn't new. This has been going on for decades. And I, I'm just a little surprised that all of a sudden it's, it's right now, but you know, for people that don't know me, um, you know, most people on YouTube know me as a guitar, drum, bass tech, stuff like that. I started my career in the music industry doing merchandise for bands and I've done everything from small, you know, dive bar clubs to stadiums doing merchandise. So this is something I've dealt with a lot. And at every level, these merch fees exist in some form or another. It's it's a rare occasion when there's no merch fee. Now, it's kind of wild because it is almost expected now that a band is going to have to pay a merch fee. But this is the fee that they pay for essentially renting the space in the venue to sell their merchandise. That's how the venues justify it. And the bands rightfully so hate that they have to give 20, 30, sometimes in extreme cases, 35 or 40% to venues because they feel as though like this is our money and you're basically just taking money that we need for the road. And, and that's 30, that's like 30% or whatever, right off the top. So it shouldn't be right off the top, but a lot of bands do that because they don't know better. Like I, I'm I really into the accounting aspect of merchandise. So when a band sells merchandise, you've got your gross sales of the night. That's like total sales. Then you got to take out the taxes in your local area because that band is going to pay taxes on everything they sold. Then there's credit card fees and stuff like yeah. that. And then yeah. after all that is taken out, that adjusted gross total is what a band should be okay. paying on. But some bands don't know this. And when they walk into a venue, if they've made you know, $5,000, they're still paying a thousand dollars of that to the venue when they really should have taken the taxes and stuff out first. Now, when bands pay these fees, again, the venues justify it by saying, well, you're using our space and it's basically a rental fee, but bands would make the argument that nobody would be here if we weren't here anyway. So it's a constant battle. The big problem with this and the reason why I don't think bands have a right to complain about it right now is because it's in every single one of their contracts. And that is the big issue, is that their agents are signing the show deals that have 20, 30, 40% built in. So while that sucks, the band, like I remember when when Alpha Wolf was on stage in that video and they were trashing the venue and they're like, yeah, right. this thing, you know, we got to pay 20% and blah, blah, blah. And then in that same video, their guitar player was like, you know, we paid it because it was in our contract. And I'm like, right there, I'm like, your your argument has no justification if you have signed a deal that says you're going to pay that. Now, the big issue that I have is that merch fees have become such a commonplace now that sometimes they're not built into the contracts mm. and the venues will still go try and collect, hoping that the band is naive enough to have not looked at their contract. So there That's are shady as hell, dude, there are bands out there that are giving promoters and venues 20% of their merch fees when merchandise was never even negotiated Oof. in their contract. So that's the, the whole situation is so weird and really, you know, sucky for every, for, for all the bands, because the, the thing that they would have to do right now is every single band would have to and tell their agents, we're not playing shows that have merch fees anymore. The problem is 
the venues have all the advantage right now. And they're like, fine, yeah. well, you're just not going to play here. And really quick, before we go any further, have you checked out my Patreon? Patrons get early access to all my main channel videos and my podcasts. I also do giveaways sometimes. For example, I just gave away a pair of these Eargasm earplugs. And if you want me to review your music, there's a way to do that as well. All you got to do is join at the $10 and up level. Then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, all you got to do is drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And I appreciate your support. It would take every band in the industry to like kind of go on a tour strike until merchandise fees are lifted for this to change. Because when you've got Live Nation and AEG with a, a grip on every venue that these bands are touring to, that's a whole, it's not like they can not play one venue and the rest of the tour is fine. Chances are if they're playing one Live Nation venue, they're playing 20 of them. Yeah. So the bands have no advantage in this argument. The agents are just going to keep signing off on it because it's part of the standard deal. And it's such a common and they also, thing. And that, I don't want to get too into the weeds of it, but they also yeah. get paid on the, the, they don't get paid on merch, so they don't really care. Yeah. Like if agents got an incentive, like if they got like a bonus for getting rid of a merch fee or something, they'd get rid of them fast. Right. Dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, business is business. And until yep. that agent, until that agent's bottom line is affected by something like this, they're not going to care, you know? So basically, if I understand it correctly, the issue is that, well, there's there's a few issues, but the main one being that because there isn't any one, there, there aren't enough artists who are willing to take a stand on this or able and just say, we're going to boycott any venue that wants a cut of merch. There aren't enough of these artists who would be willing to take that stand that it basically isn't going to change. It, it, it won't change. I'm telling you right now, like I know there's petitions in, in the UK that have been going around where venues are signing things saying we're not going to take merch fees, at least in North America. I don't see it happening. And one of the big things like you just brought up, I've I, I, I've kind of gotten in comment sections on Instagram about this because I see other big artists that chime in and they're like, yeah, like like people that are verified on Instagram, like bands that are big arena touring bands that will chime in and be like, yeah, venues are stealing from us. And I want to be like, dude, you know how this works. Yeah. Like it's in your contract. Don't, don't feed this narrative, you know, but then I've seen other smaller bands that have been like, dude, I hear what you're saying. Like we should not play these venues, but for a smaller band like us, we can't afford to not have this venue to play a show at. So in a lot of cases, these bands are stuck with the only option of playing a show in their local area at a venue that requires a merch fee. And I mean, I did a, a video on my channel where I was breaking down an actual show that I did on tour where like our gross total for the night, it was a small club. Show. I think it was from the the show box out in Seattle, like near okay. kind of your area. Yeah. Um, it was like a 10, 10 grand sales night. And then after taxes, and the fees and everything that came out, it's like that that band is really taking home like 40% of that, if if not less. So there, you know, bands have to rely and on that's this a stuff pretty on the big road. venue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like merch merchandise is what keeps bands, I would say mid to low tier bands, like smaller tours, like that's what keeps them afloat on the road. When I was in a band. A thousand dollar merch night would be the difference between us sleeping in the van or possibly all five of us sharing one room in a hotel for the night, you know, like, so it kind of sucks, but I don't see anything changing anytime soon. And uh, like I said, it would be impossible to get every band to just boycott all these venues. It, it would be impossible. Right. So do you I, think if someone like Taylor Swift was to like really put her foot Taylor Swift or Drake or someone like that. But Taylor seems to be the one that, you know, sort of takes a stand on these things. Do you think that would change anything? I think it would. Uh, I think it would bring the conversation to a, a bigger audience for sure. Um, I here's, here's the problem with an artist like Taylor Swift compared to a club band though. Uh, and this is this is something that needs to be brought up too. And I, I apologize, I didn't bring this up sooner. There are different situations with merchandise. A lot of these bands that are complaining, rightfully so, are playing in clubs 
where the venue does nothing for them. Right. They just say, there's your corner, set up your stuff, sell it. And at the end of the night, we're taking 20%. And artists like Drake or Taylor Swift or any like arena touring band, um, these arenas they actually have, do stuff. They, they have merchandise teams. So my day working merchandise for a club band is drastically different than say if I was out doing an arena tour because in a club, I do everything. I, I set up, I sell, I physically do everything all day. In an arena, all the merchandise on the tour gets counted in with the arena's merchandise staff. And then once you agree on numbers, that merchandise is theirs for the day. They set up multiple stands, they sell everything, they display everything. Then at the end of the night, you count out what's left and they cut you a check. So essentially, a merchandise manager on an arena or stadium tour has become an accountant at this point. Right. And the team at the venue literally does all the work all day. So in that case, and it's totally I see fair to take take a, yes. a, a percentage for that. You have to pay that staff that's working yeah. at the arena because that's how they make their money from that merchandise fee. So in that situation, I have no problem with merchandise fees. I do have the problem with the club band that is being told there's your dark, not lit corner with no tables and racks, go do whatever you need to do. And then you're giving us 20% <laughs> at the end of the night. Yeah. Or a Walmart card table. Dude. Yeah. It's it, dude. I've, I've been to some clubs where it's like merch is an afterthought. And it's like, yeah. if you're going to take 20% from the band that's playing here, that shouldn't be an afterthought, you know? So I just, I don't see it changing anytime soon at all, to be honest. People like Franz from Attila and a few other people have said, well, if you get a cut of merch, why don't we get a cut of the bar? It's it's a decent Since argument. We're the ones who are bringing people here to sell I, drinks. It, it's a decent argument. Um, I if I'm being 100 percent honest with you, I feel like I'm not knowledgeable enough in bar sales and how that works to really give an opinion. But I do know that the markup on drinks it shows is like astronomical, like what what these venues are playing or paying for beer and liquor and then what they're selling it for, they're making a huge profit. Um, so I don't know why that couldn't be negotiated by an agent too. Maybe because the venue does have all that power and on their side of the yeah. argument. And they're like, no, we're not doing that. But I think that's what it comes down to is like, you get what you negotiate for. You know, if you're, yeah. if you, if you are Taylor Swift or Drake or whoever, you know that you're going to sell out this arena. So you have a lot of leverage. Yeah. Um, if if you're whatever random metalcore band that's going to draw 400 people tonight, they're like, all right, then don't play here to, on Tuesday. We don't care. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And one of the things, too, is that, you know, you got to think not every show is a sellout. So, like, if you're talking that club band that that promoter brought in and they only sold like 200 tickets, chances are that promoter probably is losing money anyways. Right. And I know promoters, when they want merch fees there, that's like a safety net. It's like, a, you know, if this show doesn't do well, at least I'm going to get a little kickback from the merchandise sales, which which is fair. You know, yeah. they got to make their money. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, the bar sales thing, I, I feel like that would be a good medium or like a middle point for the, the bands and the uh, and the venues to reach. But I also feel as though bar sales are probably higher than merchandise in a lot of situations. Yeah. And the the venues aren't going to want to give more money to the band than they're getting from their merch. But, you know, there's some bands I saw. Um, do you remember that band Forever the Sickest Kids? By any yeah, chance? yeah, absolutely. I saw them sort of randomly in like 2008 or 2009. Nobody there was over 21. Also there a great point. Literally like one mom at the bar on her phone. The bartenders were looking bored as hell. And I have to imagine that the venue was not super happy about that night. And in that situation, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, I would sort of understand as much as I hate the the merch cut thing. It's like, well, we made a hundred dollars on alcohol tonight. Like yeah. we got to make our money somehow. Yeah. And it, it, that's, that's just another variable to a live show. And it's a great point to bring up because there are those bands who have like, like, I'll tell you right now, I did a tour with uh, like Nick Jonas when he first went solo doing his merchandise. Uh -huh. Merchandise sales crushed, obviously, but everybody at the show was under 21. Like it was it was like late teenagers. So it's right. like the venues aren't the, 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 the shows are sold out. They did great, but they're not making that extra money from the bar. So 
in that situation that that be talked about. But my 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 like take on the whole situation is if a venue is helping and actually doing work for the band, then a merch fee should be negotiated. But if it, again, if it's that club that's just pointing to a corner and saying, go set up and do your thing and we're going to collect at the end of the night, those should be scratched from contracts. But again, it all goes back to the contract. If it's in the contract that the band's agent has signed, there's there's no the band literally right. has no argument. Yeah. Well, speaking of Nick Jonas, uh, let's talk about your background a little bit, because okay. um from what I understand, you have worked on uh, a lot of like really big tours with, you know, you've played in this world of giant major label arena type artists and stuff that I know absolutely nothing about. So mm -hmm. tell us, you know, tell us your, your life story, at least the, the, the professional side of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you a just quick rundown. So um, I, I, my band that I was in when I was in college, uh, I was a bass player, started kind of taking off. So I dropped out of college to tour with my band. Uh, we toured for three years. We never got signed, but we did a lot of big package tours. Like back in the day, we were getting opening slots with like a day to remember all time low. But then our, our, our music was also, um, like, I, I don't want to say versatile. It's not like we're like, you know, trying to sound special, but. Our, our music could appeal to harder crowds, but also to like mainstream rock crowds. So we did tours with like trapped and stuff back in the day. Um, yeah, those pre were interesting. meltdown. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was pre meltdown, but he was still an interesting guy back then. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyways, three years of touring in a band, just the five of us in a van and trailer. It was the brokest I've ever been in my life. Like I never had more than like $10 in my bank account. Like there were days where I just didn't eat because we didn't have money and that lifestyle gets tiring. So one of the bands that I was touring with or that we were opening for, I kind of told them I was thinking about quitting my band. And they're like, if you do, we'll hire you to come work for us. And that was the start of me working for bands. And that was like 2008. So uh, the first few years uh, I, I was touring, I was actually <laughs> touring with Christian bands, which okay. is, is kind of funny for me. Um, and I went from working for my first gig ever was for a band called Red. I don't know if you're familiar. They're like Christian metal band. Um, no. they, they do a lot of stuff with like skillet. Like they have that kind okay. of sound, like yeah. symphonic metal, you know, and then um, worked for some other like you know, Christian contemporary bands, just because that's what's really big in Nashville. It's easy to find work. Sure. And then I got, I got real tired of that scene. And the first offer I had after Christian bands was Nickelback. I went from okay. working for Christian bands to Nickelback um, doing merchandise. And that's where I started like really learning about merchandise. I mean, and that's going to be kind of a, I don't want to say a trial by fire, but I imagine Nickelback's merch does crazy business and they're playing enormous shows. So like, whether you like their music or not, being able to work for something that big is cool. Dude, it was super cool. And what is crazy about doing merchandise for Nickelback, and I I've, I've, I still say this, is we sold so much merch because it was an arena tour, you know, sold out arenas all over North America. I've never seen one person in public wearing a Nickelback shirt. Ever. Never. In never. my life. <laughs> Like, and yes, they're I mean, selling 10,000 shirts a night or whatever. Oh, dude. I mean, e easily like it's, it's ridiculous. We sold so much merch on that tour and I never, I've never seen anybody sporting Nickelback stuff in public. I find that so funny. Never. Um, and then for quite a few years, I did a lot of classic rock bands and it was kind of interesting. Like I went from Nickelback to Van Halen. I did the Van Halen reunion tour in 2012. Wow. Um, met a lot of great people. And that was kind of like my, I guess, for lack of a better word, my coming of age tour. Um, I was like 22 or 23 and I, I got to admit, like I was, I just was a cocky young kid. I was like, I got the Van Halen tour. I'm the shit. And then I got out there and realized very quickly that all these older road dogs that have been out here for decades, like, like, like they didn't like me. I, I'll say it right now. Like I learned the hard way with tough like for love. For good that, reason like, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was a young cocky dumb kid that like, because I, I've only been touring for like, you know, four years working for bands and all of a sudden got a, a legacy act like that. I was right. just very arrogant and dumb about it. And I, uh, I learned like tough love on that tour. It was like, this is how you need to act on a tour. So very quickly, I just kind of, 
kept my mouth shut, did my work, you know, learned from a lot of the older guys. And by the end of that tour, it was like five or six months. It was like I had made friends with everybody out there and I really grew up and learned how to like act on tour. Um, after that, I spent a few years working for Pat Benatar, which was pretty wild. Um, her and her husband are phenomenal people. Um, and then I, after that, I kind of started like branching out into what I'm doing now, like more guitar tech backline, you know, drums and stuff like that. Um, you know, through the years it's been, you know, walk off the earth was another band I was with for a while. Then I did Nick Jonas. I did the sick puppies for a very quick second. Um, life house faith, no more. And then, you know, the, from 2015 till the pandemic, I started working in country in Nashville. I was working for an artist named Dustin Lynch and mm -hmm. I like some country. Um, country is not normally my scene, but it's great touring country music really takes care of their crew. Um, it was the most comfortable I've been on tour. It's the reason I was there for it six years. It seems like a very professional industry in general. It is. It is very, it, it's, it's run very well. Um, everybody in the country genre of the industry, super professional. Um, I will say th the partying in the country industry is like harder than anything. Like they party harder on the country tours I've been on than on the Nickelback tour I was on. It's insane. Um, Interesting. And, and, and when I say that, I'm not talking like, 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 like drugs or anything. It's just like, they, they know how to drink man. And they do. It's like, I always joke that it's almost a job requirement that you have to like <laughs> just just pound alcohol on uh, country tours. And that is one of the reasons I'm sober now. Like it was too much. I just stopped. And uh, did you have a problem or just felt like you were over it or what what led you I, to do that? I would say I had a problem. Absolutely. I have no shame in in telling people like I was absolutely a full blown alcoholic. Um, OK. It never got to a point where it affected my marriage or my my job or anything like that. But it was like it was in every you day could see it kind of heading in that direction. It, it, yeah, I I consider myself fortunate. Um, I got sober before anything like really drastic happened. But the the potential was there. If, if I was still drinking today, I would probably have ruined my entire job and everything. So. Um, there were incidents that happened on the road and there was one specific thing that led me to being like, I'm done. Um, but it wasn't anything that did like affect again, like my job, my marriage, my life, anything like that. It was just, it, it was a wake up moment. It, it was a wake up moment on tour. Right? Is that just something like, you can I'm talk done. about or no? Um, yeah, I could. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, we every year. So, and over the years I had these incidents, like I was the kind of drinker where I, I didn't drink during the day. Like I always had this rule for myself that if, if somebody's paying me to work, I'm not drinking while I'm working. But the second the shows got done, it was like, is it, it was on. Like I was, I was an absolute animal. Um, every year, Luke Bryan does this festival in Cancun, Mexico called crash my playa. And it's the ticket is an insane price, but it includes your flights and a week stay at an all inclusive resort. And they build a stage on the beach and they bring down all these big country bands every year. And there's four shows that week, Wednesday through Saturday. Everybody parties during the day. They go to the show at night. And every year we went down there, you know, we'd go for a week and we'd only have one show. So what do we do the whole time we're there? We just party. Um, and one of the years we went down there, day one, um, I'll try and keep this story as short as possible while hitting the details. Um, I just got annihilated, wasted. And for some reason, I was at the hotel bar um, that night and uh, Dustin, who I was working for at the time, his manager walked into the bar, a person that I did not like and had a lot of problems with. For some reason, in my blacked out drunken rage, I saw him. I decided I don't like him. I'm going to I'm going to do something about it. Oh, boy. And I like. <laughs> kicked out my bar stool, went over to him, like threw him into a wall and started yelling at him. I don't, I don't remember this. Like I was completely blackout wasted. This is all story wow. that I was told basically physically assaulted the manager of the guy I was working for. And then the next day, like, well, this up is a and, big artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this is, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to be messing with his manager. Yeah. And, uh, 
the next day, I don't remember a thing. I just woke up in my hotel room and was like hung over and we're like, oh, last night was crazy. And everybody was texting me and like, dude, it's like you, you messed up. And um, that was my moment where I was like, I, I, I have to be done. Like alcohol has, has controlled my actions and my personality too much to the point now where I like, I feel like I'm out of control. Um, and I will say to, to Dustin's credit and this manager, um, at our next show, when we got home to the States, they called me into the tour production office and I thought that they, I thought I was getting fired like 100% for sure. Rightfully so. Yeah. 100%. Any other gig, I think I would have got fired. Um, but they came to me from a place of, uh, concern and care rather than like bringing just full on wrath. Um, they sat me down and were just like, you know, all right, you know, you know what happened when we were in Mexico? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, are you okay? And I was like, what? They're like, we just, you know, over the last year, it's, it's these incidents and your drinking has been getting like worse and worse and worse. Like, are you okay? Like, is there something going on? Is there something you need to talk about? Anything like that? And I was, I was so blown away. It was so, I was like in tears because I was emotional. I couldn't believe they came to me and actually cared enough to Mm -hmm. talk to me about it. And um, to this day, I will give them that credit for just, you know, not a lot of people would have done that. That's really cool. Yeah. A lot of other people probably would have been like, you're a drunk asshole. You're off this tour. They actually came to me from a sincere point of concern. And uh, that's where that would, that was my moment where I was just like, I'm done. And I, ha- I haven't touched anything since like no drugs, no alcohol, no nothing. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, you're wearing a children of Bodum hoodie right now. You've got, yeah. you know, electric cowboy and whatever, you know, metal records, like you're a metal guy, but you've worked primarily, well, I don't know, primarily, but at least on a lot of non-metal tours with yeah. artists where I'm sure you don't necessarily love their music. And a lot of people, you know, I, I think a lot of people have this idea that you can't be happy unless you're working on a product or type of music or whatever that you personally like. In my experience, so like I did a lot of stuff for like Swiffer and Febreze and stuff like that, mm-hmm. that I thought was going to be really boring. But it turns out it was actually really interesting and fun in large part because I loved the people that I was working with, even though, you know, I never gave two shits about Swiffer necessarily as a product. But the people were cool. The businesses were run very well. What are your kind of thoughts on that as far as, you know, enjoying like the difference between like enjoying working with someone versus enjoying their music? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I I actually love that you brought that up because you're one of the people on YouTube that I, I love right now that like while you do have your certain style of music that you seem to to gravitate to, you like a lot of other things. And I'm the same way. Like everybody pegs me as this brutal metalhead, but like I love a lot of different kinds of music. I listen to a lot of hip hop and rap. I listen to a lot of pop. I listen to country here and there. I listen to a lot of techno like I do gravitate towards metal, but I like a lot of other things. So that being said, I'm 100% honest. I've never worked on a tour where I like disliked the music that was being played. Okay. I have, I have found a way to enjoy everything I've ever worked on. And I think that especially working in the music industry, if you enjoy the actual job that you're doing on the road, whether it was the merchandise or guitar teching or drum teching, you can find a way to enjoy everything else. So while the current state of like, like bro country for lack of a better term is not what I would normally turn on while I'm sitting at home. I thoroughly enjoyed Dustin sets every night. Sure. I, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to Florida Georgia line when we were touring with them, the shows are good. The songs are fun and catchy. Like I'm the kind of person that when it comes to music, If it makes you feel good or makes you feel something, enjoy it. Too many people base their entire identities and personalities around the genre they like. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you see that in metal so much because it's like, it's not metal. And I'll admit when I was 16, 
I was that asshole kid. It was like, sure. it doesn't have double bass and screaming. It's not real music. And, you know, then you grow up and you're like, but if you're doing that when you're 38. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and a lot sad. of people do. Yeah. There's a lot of them. So, I mean, yeah, dude, every tour I've ever worked, I've found a way, even if it was a, an artist that I like wasn't familiar with, I started to get to know their music. And there were, there were times like, you know, Pat Benatar, you know, eighties rock legend. It's like, yeah. I knew some of her big songs when I started working for her, but I didn't know her whole discography. And man, like throughout that tour, it was just like, God, there are such good songs that they have that I was never familiar with. And I was able to really f enjoy all of the music like Nick Jonas, dude, that would probably be one that other metalheads would be like, what? That guy's first solo album he released that had like Chains and Jealous and all that stuff on it. It was so good. And I, I bet he's also an incredible performer. I've never seen him, but I'm sure he's amazing. He was great. He uh, pers uh, personality wise, he's a very quiet, shy person, but he's very nice. But the funnest thing about that tour or most interesting thing was his entire band, with the exception of like two people, had never toured in their lives. Oh, wow. Um, he had his music director. Uh, he trusted his music director, who was his keyboard player, enough to just be like, find me a band, like wow. pick, pick, pick whoever you want. And this guy grew up on the west side of Chicago, uh, his music director, and he went to his church in Chicago and got all these like 21 year old gospel <laughs> chop church players right. to come play for Nick. And they are some of the best musicians <laughs> I've ever toured with. But it was fun because every city we went to, it was their first time and they're young and they're excited. And it's like, this is so cool. And it was, it was just a cool experience to, for somebody that had been touring for a while to see that joy in, in somebody that's, you know, traveling right. for the first time and enjoying all of that. And it was, it was just, it was fun. And the music was great. And you mentioned the gospel chops thing and that's sort of, you know, there's this idea among a lot of metal people that like metal is the pinnacle of everything, you know, the best musicians and everyone that's not in the metal scene is a terrible person and blah, 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 like all these preconceived notions. And, you know, with you having worked with country and some of these gospel musicians and stuff, you know, you realize that's not true at all. And there's no. super talented, super cool people in every scene. And in fact, I mean, you would know better than I do, but based on my sort of limited experience, I think like the level of musicianship and professionalism and pop and country is really like probably the, the gold standard. But it, pop and country is the pinnacle of like, if you, it, when I first started doing pop and country tours, it blew my mind that some of these musicians were as good as they were because in metal you get um, when a lot of metal players come up, they're like garage players. They're self-taught, yeah. which is awesome. That's super cool. That's how I, I taught myself. But a lot of these metal players are phenomenal at playing fast and shredding, and they know what they're yeah. doing. They're good musicians. Let's not take that away. But a lot of these pop and country players, um, they studied theory. And you can play anything. Anything. And you have to when you're working for a yeah. country band. So what blew my mind whenever we saw, uh, whenever we did country tours was, that first tour I ever did with Dustin, I was so shocked and blown away by how good his musicians were. And not only that, but their music theory that they had, like a lot of these country shows, um, they have segments of their set where if it's like halfway through the set and they're trying to get the crowd fired up, they might cover some country classics like, you know, Friends in Low Places, yeah. you know, John Deere Green, something like that. So you'll randomly get your artist on stage, get into the talkback microphone to talk to everybody in the in-ears and be like, hey, let's do Friends in Low Places. And then you'll you'll see the band. It's kind of it's kind of magical. You'll see the band. I'll start looking at each other and they'll be like, um, what are we going to play? And they're like, A minor? You get yeah. with A minor? Yeah, yeah, A minor. Yeah. And that's all they, and they need just to go. know. And that's all they need to know. And it sounds amazing. Yeah. they Like songs that, perfect example. Uh, Luke Bryan's bass player, uh, current bass player is a friend of mine. And when they just did that Crash My Playa Festival in Mexico, Lionel Richie came down because uh, he does, uh, was it American Idol, I think, with Luke Bryan? Um, Lionel wanted to play a spur of the moment set. 
And Luke's like, well, you can use my band. So with like five hours notice, his band got together and they asked Lionel what he wanted to play. And all these guys needed to do is listen to all the songs once, know what key it was going to be in and just crush it. Like they've been doing it for years. So that's the difference really with pop and country. Most of the pop and country players are school musicians who can play anything in the spur of the moment. They know their instruments. They know their scales, their notes, everything. You know, my wife and I were watching uh, Lizzo's live concert that's streaming uh, the other night. And uh, her band is just like, I know metalheads look at pop bands and they're like, yeah, it's pop. Like those players in those bands are some of the most skilled musicians in the world. On the planet, because she is she is a giant global star. Mm -hmm. And she wants only the absolute best. And anybody on earth, you know, that's like a session musician, you know, would drop whatever they're doing to play with her. So she is recruiting. She's like the NFL. She's recruiting from the best of the best of the best. Yep. Like, I don't know who plays bass for Lizzo, but I guarantee it's a bad, bad motherfucker. Yeah. And her, her band is all female too. So, okay. And that is one thing in the music industry that I'm sure you're aware of that like, you don't see that that much. Like yeah. even dude, even when I have toured like as a roadie, it is not often that you get women on tour because there right. is that sense of old school men work harder, you know, and I'll and tell you right won't now, fit in. And yeah, I'll tell you right now, every woman I've worked with has like outworked every dude in their position on tour. And well, they I've have had, to, unfortunately, I, I was just going to say, I have had some of my women friends that I've toured with tell me like, we, we kind of have to, to, to compensate because people don't take us seriously on tour. Yeah. Um, so Lizzo having an all female band that that pool of musicians that she's looking at is even smaller. So, you know, those those women are probably the best of the best in the industry at their respective instruments. And it's just it's just wild, man. And I saw recently uh, Lizzo is doing a European tour right now. And I don't know if you saw like the headline on all the metal sites. They're like. Lizzo did this funny bit in her set where she started, you know, talking to the crowd. And she was like, do, do host. And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Trying to, you know, be funny and just have fun with the crowd. Yeah. Dude, metalheads are ripping her apart on the internet right now because what? they're, because they're dumb. They're stupid. <laughs> what did like, she do? Cause she said a Ramstein lyric. Is yeah, they're like, how, that? how, how dare she make fun of Rammstein like that? And blood, like she wishes she was half as talented as those guys. I'm like, you guys are such assholes for a community. Dude, she is so ridiculous. I find her irritating as a person, yeah. but she is fucking absurdly talented. As oh, a musician. It's, it's, it's unreal. Like it's absurd, but I, I made a comment on, I think Loudwire or metal feed or whatever, where, cause all the comments, you, you get internet trolls that they can't come up with original comments. So everybody, literally all the comments were making fun of her after that for, for being, you know, fat and black. That yeah, literally, that's all the, no, insults. that's what it is. And I was like, you know, the metal community has always talked about itself being so tolerant and inclusive of everybody. And like, we're, we're, we're friendly with everybody. I'm like, that is not true, man. At all. No, unfortunately. No, unfortunately, it's not. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, for a community that tries to act like it's so tolerant and, and, and accepting of everybody, it's one of the most judgmental communities. And I know I'll probably get railed on for saying that, but it's it's the truth. I've been a metalhead since I've been an early teenager, and that is 100 percent the truth. It, it, it is. And I've noticed, like, on that note, um as you said, the metal fans never want to admit this and they always insist that it's so inclusive and like, Oh, well we can't be racist. Cause look, you know, seven dust exists. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, anytime I mention someone who is female or black or even worse, both the comments are like very noticeably more negative every oh, yeah. time. Yeah. It, it's insane. Like, is dude. that a coincidence? No, unfortunately. And it's funny, um, you know, Claire, um, my wife, um, she up until we had our, our daughter, she was in a dance company in Nashville for years. She's been a choreographer and a professional dancer her entire life. 
And we have a lot of friends that are black or in the LGBTQ community. And we've, we've had conversations with them about, about this stuff. And it's like, you know, the fact that every time seven dust gets brought up a band that's been around for 25 years, probably yeah. a little longer, the fact that, like, Hey, did you know they have a black singer? It's like, yeah, he's been in the band for 25 years. Why? Like the fact that that's still getting brought up by people right. shows that like, they're trying to be hip and be like, oh, yeah, I like a band right. with a black guy in it. It's like, dude, you know, I don't know. I just don't get it. And it's the same with female singers. It's like yep. every anytime there's a female singer, people act like they're so blown away. They're like, wow. And I'm like, dude, I mean, we were listening to like, you remember like like Kitty and Otep mm -hmm. back in the day? It's like there have been female bands like this forever, but for some reason, I, I think there's a sense that sometimes metalheads to prove that they are so, you know, open and non judgmental, they want to like a band that has a black person in it, or they want yeah. to like a band that has a female in it. So they can say like, I don't have any prejudices. I listen to ginger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> they have a female singer. So it, it's just, it, it, I, I could talk about this forever because it does annoy me and it's not everybody. Let's be, let's be very sure. clear. Like, there are some wonderful people in the metal community. There are also some terrible people. And but it's enough people that like, I think it's bullshit. To pre and I'm not saying this is what you're doing, but I think it's bullshit to just pretend like it's some tiny number of people that don't matter. All right. Well, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments that mm -hmm. reflect this. Like how many hundreds of comments do you need to see before you admit that? Okay. Actually, it might be a problem. 100%. And anytime I anytime I've said something about like like being like pro LGBTQ or something like that, I, dude, I get the comments on my YouTube channel yeah. like all of a sudden I'm I'm the woke libtard that like, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, you know, same with um, you know, when I did the Lorna Shore video for uh Pain Remains, like on an emotional level that song hit me very hard because I was able to connect to it and relate to it. And there were people that were, you know, making fun of me for just just showing emotion. And I'm just like, yeah. just drop the tough guy act like it's not impressing anybody. And to to be 100 percent fair, it's not just metal. It's it's every music community because country is also horrible. Like there are some there are some horrible things in the country industry as sure. well. Like when we do summer country festivals. Dude, I can't tell you the amount of Confederate flags that are waving at the festival <laughs> crowds and like the crazy. And then like, you know, they have one black fan that'll show up and then all of the hillbillies that are there will be like, see, we're we're inclusive. Right. Like we've got black people. Cowboy here Troy us. exists. Like, oh, my God, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, Cowboy, I can't believe you just name dropped Cowboy Troy, dude. <laughs> I actually listen to a lot of country. Like I, yeah. mostly I listen to like pop and country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially like, like pop country. So I, I did a, I did a, a, a tour with Big and Rich like way back in the day, and Cowboy Troy was like, yeah, he was the one person that would come to the merch table every night when I was doing merch and like sign autographs and hang with people. So I've spent some some time with him. That dude is funnier than hell. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it obviously like this stuff exists in every scene and every genre, but. I mean, I think it's a real problem. Like to me, like, you you know, if you've seen my videos, you know that I mm. think of like, how do we make this kind of music more mainstream and any kind of like backward, bigoted kind of beliefs among fans is just absolute cancer in terms of making the genre more relevant and mainstream because that rightfully gets less and less acceptable every year. And like you compare that with pop, you know, or rap or anything else, like there was like zero room for people like that. Yeah. Zero. Like you, ca you cannot like imagine being like anti-woman or anti-black in the pop world. Like it's, it, mm -hmm. it can't exist. Yeah. And it's like, we're at a point in the metal community where where metal is 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 getting popular again. I mean, you've got dude. I, yeah. I never I never thought I'd see a day where where deathcore bands are selling out tours in advance. It's bonkers. Like and hitting the you know Spotify a viral top fifty. It's it's crazy, and it's metal right now is starting to get like 
it's almost like we're back in like the turn of the century when new metal was mainstream, mm -hmm. like, like extreme metal is starting to get mainstream. And with the metal community, again, it likes to act like it's all like loving and inclusive and stuff like that. People need to stop pretending that it's like that and, and call it out when it's not yep. because I see it way too much, man. And it, it, it bums me out. There are, there are, there are definitely days as a metalhead where I, I see comments on certain posts and stuff like that. And I'm just like, God, I don't want to be associated with any of these people. <laughs> like it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, like as an example of this, that blows my mind. So Nurgle from behemoth is friends with the guy from Graveland. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're mm -hmm. a literal actual nazi band i'm not yep. being like one of these like woke people that calls any republican a nazi like yeah the guy is in a band that sieg heils and has swastikas and stuff and nurgle takes pictures with him and calls him a good friend and was like on a graveland album back in the day mm -hmm. and everyone's like oh well you know whatever why do we have to bring politics into this and like the dude is a literal nazi and you people are like indifferent to this like, yeah. what world am I living in? And you you hear the argument from people a lot where they're like, well, you know, you just got to learn to separate the artist from the art. And no, I, like, I don't. Mm, no, no, no. Yeah, I <laughs> you don't. It, it's right now. It's the conversation that people are having about Phil from Pantera. Right. Like, do I think that Phil is an actual like neo-Nazi dude? I, I really don't. Probably I think yeah. I think he's just one of those like th th I know so many people I've toured with that are in like their 40s that still act like an edgy 14 year old because they get a yeah. rise out of people and they just like to be edgy. And, you know, you see the the clips of of, of Phil doing the fucking Zig Heils and yeah. stuff like that. And you're like, do I actually think he's a Nazi? No. Is this appropriate, though? Absolutely not. But there are so many people that are defending him and that are like, well, you know, it's Phil like, you know, it's yeah. just Phil goofing around or like screaming white power and doing Hitler salutes is not a joke. Like it's it's not Even it's if not he funny. meant it as a joke. It's not OK. End it's of terrible story. Joke. The end period. Yeah. And like it, you've seen the clip of Dimebag at Nam. Um, Someone asked him to sign a guitar. Yeah. And he says, can that N word play? N -word oh, with God. I know. R. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I love Pantera's music with all my heart. They're one of my favorite bands of all time. And I don't want that to be true. But it's like, dude, if you're Sieg Heiling on stage and saying white power and dime bag with a totally straight face says the N word with a hard R, just yeah. like it's nothing like what do you like I, you can't deny it you got to no. just admit like if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck then it is a duck and i hate mm -hmm. saying that because i absolutely love pantera but like we can't make excuses for this yeah i, I agree and i i think rob flynn i know people hate on rob flynn from machine head but like I, he, not not all of his takes i agree with like he does sure. say some stuff where i'm like whatever but after that thing happened with phil at the dime bash um excuse me, uh, Rob had a really good take on that and was like, guys, we need to stop giving passes to these artists for their actions just because we like their music so much. Yep. And you had a fantastic video on that whole separating the art from the artist and make up your own decision about how you want to support them with what they've done. And I loved that video because a good example of that for me is um, Tim Lambesis. Yeah. Like, I will not listen to Azalea dying anymore. I won't. No, never. Um, I have friends that do. I'm not going to shame them for it. I'm not going to judge them for it. Whatever. That's their choice. But for me on a personal level with my morals and what I believe, I cannot support something like that, like with a person that has done something like that. And, you know, it, it, Pantera it, it is one of those for me, too. It's it's I love that band. I've loved their music, but I look at their career and I'm just like, oh, this is a bummer because like it's a huge it, bummer. I don't want it to be true, but I'm not going to deny reality. Yeah. And you you always get the fans that. I don't even think they're trying to to defend the band. 
I think they're trying to defend themselves from supporting yes. the band because you hear everything, especially about Pantera. It's like, wow, they're from Texas. You know, that's how they were back then. You know, yeah. oh, they're from a different generation. They talk different. I was like, dude, if people can change and grow up, because I'll be honest, like I've said this many times on my channel. I'm not an angel here, dude. When I was yeah. in, when I was a teenager, dude, I used horrible derogatory language Dude, because, i said horrible shit in my 30s <laughs> yeah like we're 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 we just we're in that we're in a certain place where we just don't think about it and like yeah you know eventually you you grow you change or you don't and unfortunately some people just don't you know so. yeah it's sad um well I, I wanted to ask you a couple things about youtube before i let you go um okay. in particular you did a video saying, you know, that 2023 was going to be different for you. And you mentioned that you were having anxiety attacks and stuff like that. And just in general, that YouTube was maybe not great for your mental health, uh, which I resonate deeply with that, obviously. <laughs> um, can you talk about that and kind of where you're at with that now? Yeah. I mean, when I first started doing YouTube, I never thought it was even going to turn into anything. It was a pandemic boredom thing because we couldn't tour and, you know, um, and then it turned into what it has now and <clears throat> it's still fun. I won't say it's not fun. If it, if it wasn't, I wouldn't be doing it, but it has become, um, stressful. Um, it's the constant pressure of, um, not only having content on time because I'm, you know, we have a kid and I'm, I'm touring again. I literally just got back from home from tour yesterday. Um, and I'm like looking at my schedule and I'm like, God, I got to record like three videos in the next day to stay on schedule. And there are some days where I just don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, but then there's there's the pressure of, um, you know, I'm doing less and less reactions. And when I don't do the reactions to what people want to see, I hear about it. And that's all I get in comments. And that gets stressful. So a few yeah. months, about six months back, man, I just started. I just started getting these random anxiety attacks and it's never happened. And it's like, it's like debilitating. It's like, I'll get to a point where I just, I, 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 my, my chest gets all tight and I feel like something bad's going to happen and I, I can't breathe. And I'm like, I, I was never having this before until I started doing all this social media content. And mm -hmm. I know there's people out there that are just like, well, what you guys do is easy. You're just making videos sitting at your computer. And I'm like, and they're right. We're not working on the coal mines. We're, yeah, for sure. There is a lot more work that goes into it than I think the normal person thinks about. I mean, re recording the video, like right now, while we're doing this, this is the easy part. Yeah. Like after this, because this is your podcast, like you're going to have to edit this and make a thumbnail and set it all up for that. You know, I did this last night with another podcast I have coming out and um, there's a lot more time that I've put into this than I ever thought there would be. And I think it's finally starting to take like a mental toll where it's like, you know, I need to start focusing more on just, just me being happy and healthy than, than trying to pump out content. And it also, I think a lot of that too, is a financial thing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, over the pandemic, we couldn't tour and that's, if I'm being honest, that's all I know, man. Like I, I could probably go work at guitar center or something like that, but like, you know, music, uh, not necessarily music, but like instruments and touring is all I know. And this because of that and i want to stay home with the kid youtube is what i've put all my energy into and as you know during certain times of the year ad revenue goes down and stuff and very stressful if like oh cool my paycheck is 40 percent lower this month dude that, that would have december to january my my yep. paycheck was literally probably 60 or 70 percent lower to be honest and that's stressful because YouTube up until recently when I started touring again has been what's paid our bills over the pandemic. And if that revenue goes down, it means, damn, damn, maybe I can't pay one of my bills this month. And that's, I don't know, all this stuff has just been adding up. And I finally think it boiled over to the point where I actually went and saw like a doctor about it. And they immediately, they were like, like most doctors do, they were just like, we can give you medication. And I was like, yeah. I mean, is is therapy an option? Because I, I probably feel like I have a lot of stuff that I've never unpacked ever that I, I think I'd benefit more from talking it out than just taking medication. Not that I'm opposed to taking the medication. It's harder to get therapy than it is 
to get medication, <laughs> yeah. which is insane. Like, oh, well, it's three months to see a therapist and your insurance doesn't cover it. Like, but you'll just give me a controlled substance. Yeah. And I, I was I was having a conversation with my dad about this the other day. The last few months, I think I've turned into a hypochondriac, dude, because I've been having so many panic attacks and I've been feeling so weird. It's something that's never happened to where now it's like every two minutes of the day, I'm like checking my heart rate on my Fitbit. I'm taking like I have a blood pressure thing sitting here and I, I keep doing all these things and I'm it's maddening. Like I'm driving myself crazy over my health because I can't figure out where it's coming from or how to fix it yet. You know, I never had any problems sleeping in my entire life until about two years ago. I started having like nighttime panic attacks, mm -hmm. maybe three years ago. Yeah, probably about three years ago. I had started having these nighttime panic attacks. Um, and uh, I don't know for sure that it's because of social media, but it seems like it's pretty likely. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. getting berated by hundreds and hundreds of people constantly having a different Reddit thread every week about what a horrible person I am. Yeah, dude. Seems likely. You know, and, and, <sighs> One of the hardest things, and I'm going to, I'm going to admit this to you since we're sitting here talking, one of the hardest things, especially even for me, before I started doing YouTube was all you see about a person that does content creation is whatever you see in their videos. Yeah. And then you can formulate your own opinion. You don't, you don't see this person as you almost dehumanize the person that you're looking at on social media. And that's where a lot of that comes from. Like, I know that there's people like when people talk shit to me on my YouTube and stuff like that and they call me gay or whatever. It's like 2023, find a better insult, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, they don't see the the me off screen where I have where I've been married for 10 years and I have a two year old daughter and I have dogs that I love and, you know, just like. I have a great life. I'm not going to complain. Like I'm happy. I'm married. We have a beautiful child, but people don't see that. So when they go on the attack online, they just see content creator or whatever. And yeah. they say whatever they want. You know, one of the most, you know, and, and I, I what I was going to say is I, when I first started doing content, didn't realize that. I was like the person when I first started doing YouTube, I was that person that when I looked at other YouTubers, I kind of dehumanized them as well until I started understanding like, oh, you know, they're, they're people like we're all people. Yeah. You, know? you see like one facet of this person on YouTube, which is I don't want to say a character, but, you know, it's like just, you know, same way yeah. as an artist when they're on stage is not the same person as when they're off stage. One hundred percent. My wife realizes she knows when I get done with my Twitch streams on the weekend, like I need like a half hour to decompress because I've been on for three hours. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not putting on a character and I'm not being fake, but there is a sense of you, you have to be on and it yeah. gets exhausting. And you know, it's not the same energy as if someone was sitting in a room with you, just like having chatting over coffee. Yeah. Like right, right now in terms of content is like the, the most like real, I feel like we're just sitting here having a conversation. I don't yeah. have to be on for, my stream or my video. And, um, but I'll admit there were people that I looked at on YouTube, you being one of them where I was like, I'd hear some of your takes on things and I'd be like, fuck that uh, guy. Uh, I don't know if I ever said it that extreme, but I was like, nah, this guy's, you know, I I've said, I was like, yeah, Finn just says stuff to rile people up. Like he probably doesn't even believe on his blah, 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 whatever. And then you start to get to know people like, dude, I used to rip on Alex Hefner so much. And then I got to know him and I'm like, I love this guy. Like, you know, and that's one of the things too, is the difference between people's upbringings is like, I was, when I first started doing YouTube, the crowd that I surrounded myself with was not the crowd that I should have. It was bad for my mental health. And I acted like an idiot. Um, and I thought that my content was better because I'm being real and I'm only yeah. watching stuff that these are authentic reactions and all these other people that say they've never heard Nirvana before are lying. And then I, I really legitimately started realizing like, you know, like I look at Alex Hefner and, and Nick Nocturnals, those guys are like 25. Yeah. And it's like, so now thinking about that and thinking about how they grew up and what they were, you know, um, open to when they were younger it's like okay 
it does make sense that somebody like Alex Hefner probably didn't listen to Slipknot until now because he wasn't a teenager like I was. I mean, I've never Slipknot listened to the out. Isley Brothers or something in my <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. So why would I? I, I I, I think there actually is a lot more authenticity to a lot of YouTube reactions than people might think. And by the way, even if it's not like I've made fun of it, but like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. It's entertaining. Like if it's people enjoy it, I don't yeah. give a fuck. Yeah. At I've, the end I've, of the day, if it makes people happy for them, I'm not saying that any of those people are doing anything fake, but like if it makes their audience happy to watch them or anyone fake react to hearing Nirvana for the first time. So what I'm, I yeah. might, I'm still going to make a joke about it, but I don't actually care. Yeah. 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 I, I, when I, when I first started doing content, I think I cared more than I do now about what other people were doing. And now I don't at all. It's like, I'm not worried about what everybody else is doing. I do my thing and I've made great friends in, in, in the YouTube community now that I talk to a lot. And it's, Again, it, it when I first started out, I fell into that trap of dehumanizing a lot of other fellow content creators. And now I I, I don't. I have a completely different outlook. And it, it's it, that has been one step better for my mental health, worrying less about other people's content and just worrying about mine. But, you know, it does. There are times where out of nowhere it will get bad. Like the, the worst the worst day I ever had on YouTube. And I know it was the worst day because of how I felt. I did a video calling out uh nightwish a band that i enjoy to be honest mm -hmm. um they are they, this is fact they are the most reacted to band on youtube um that i did is, not know that 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 is an actual fact because mm -hmm. their fans have a discord server where they log every reaction that's ever oh, been no. made to a nightwish song oh no <laughs> and it's dude it's tens of thousands it's nuts but their management so you ended very, up in their crosshairs. <clears throat> yeah, well, because of what I said, um, their management is very strict about their copyrights. Uh, they are signed with Nuclear Blast Records, a mm -hmm. label that is very cool to work with that I've worked with with many things that will gladly clear copyrights when I check out new releases. But I was told by them they can clear anything but Nightwish because Nightwish's management has said that they do not support reactors and will not unblock and uncopyright claim videos. Okay. Which is their right. 100%. Even if you think it's maybe a bad decision, it, they, they, you do not have the right to use their content. Exactly. And if, and, and that's why I don't do Nightwish reactions anymore because when I found that out, I was like, if they don't approve of it, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Um, But they made a post one day bragging about how they were the most reacted to band on it was an instagram post where they were like we're the most reacted to band on youtube and blah 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 well, why like, do you block everything and that's what i made my video about and i called yeah. it out and i was just like this is such a hypocritical thing and then the fans need to understand that while they're sitting here bragging about all these reactions and how they're so popular on youtube Behind the scenes, they are actively making sure that videos aren't unblocked and they have copyright claims on them. They will manually copyright claim stuff if one slips through the cracks. Uh, their 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 diehards went after me, dude. Like, and I usually can separate out negative comments and be like, whatever, you know. Yeah. But for some reason, it was so overwhelming that that day was like probably the most like. The closest to being full on depressed I've ever been, because that was the first time I ever felt like the full brunt force of Internet negativity directly aimed at me where I was like, this sucks. Like it does suck. I mean, I obviously, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it sucks to have like hundreds or thousands because this has happened to me many times. Yeah. Hundreds or thousands of people just fucking hammering you and telling you all kinds of horrible things for like several days. It sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not fun. It's like <laughs> it sucks. I, you know, I don't. I and don't I need... think what you said is a pretty reasonable thing. It's not like you were calling them names for how they look or something like that. I mean, yeah. you're talking you're, you're talking about business. That's fair game. Yeah, and I specifically said in that video too. I was like, this might not be a Nightwish band related thing. This could be their management calling yeah. the shots and. You know, bands are very protective or sorry, fans are very protective of the bands that they love and they don't want to hear bad things. But even though I, I specifically made sure I said this might not be the band making this call that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. They they just people hear what they want to hear, dude. It got so bad that like 
I just stopped looking at comments completely. And yeah. then, um, you know, it, but then it, it started spilling into other videos. And then people were like, I'd post a video two weeks later and, you know, people would still Have be Have you reevaluated re your stupid opinion on Nightwish yet? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's like, like and fuck, people- Fuck, man, let it go. Yeah, and people, you know, you 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 say one criticism from something, and then people think, um, you know, you hate it. So it's like, yeah, you know, there was there was somebody I know that that has a good like analogy for this, where it's like somebody's like, hey, what's your favorite color? And you know, I say red, and they're like, oh, so you hate blue? Then I was like, yeah. I didn't say that. That's how okay. people on the internet act. If you don't overwhelmingly like something it means you hate it that's how people this is it. why i stopped putting any kind of critical opinions in my main channel video because i just don't want to hear it i don't like all people want is for me to praise bands they like so that's what i do now mm -hmm. yeah i had a video Which I, sucks. Had... I don't i don't like i don't love that but that's just that's yeah. what they want so that's what they get but you can't win because then you when can't. you praise when you praise too many bands people are like oh they're not being honest and yeah. You know, I've had it happen. Like I genuinely love music. And even if I don't necessarily like a song, I always try and find something about the actual music itself that sure. I can enjoy. So even if I don't like a song, I'm like, hey, this was mixed and produced very well. And some of the parts are cool, but the song itself didn't hit me, whatever. And I've I've had a handful of reactions on my channel that um, I, I, I've said straight up like, the production sounds great. The video is cool. It's just this song didn't do anything for me. And it's happened with bands I like. Like, I absolutely love Sabaton. And one of their last singles they released, I did the reaction and I was just like, yeah, this one just, it's just not doing it for me. That's yeah. just, you know, and their fans were like, what? But you love this band. How can you not like this? I'm like, because every song can't be a banger. Right. Like, you know, it just, it just, it, music is such a, emotional personal connection to things that it's like every single song isn't going to get me like you know there are some of my favorite bands where if if i'm listening to an album there might be a certain song that i skip even if it's one of my favorite bands i just didn't like the song it's not a big deal yeah well on that note i'm gonna let you go because i got somebody calling me that i need to talk to but <laughs> uh i could talk to you all day i appreciate this and uh i will talk to you soon for sure, dude. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Talk to you later. Bye. See you, buddy.